Александр Сергеевич в своем основном докладе. Александр Сергеевич in his keynote repented the fact that he had not understood what the Soviets were. After that, another presenter repented the same. I am also forced to repent. Not only do I have to repent, I also have to say that it was exactly from the very Alexei Alexeyevich Sergeyev, who was head of the methodology sector of the Economics Institute and was my official opponent when I had my viper for my doctor's dissertation, that I learned with a large amazement after having read Lenin's collected works, I did not pay attention to it and I have to repent. And it was only Alexei Alexeyevich who enlightened us, and we, since then, have been trying to enlighten other comrades too. But it is not an easy task, because we are surrounded by various quote-unquote Soviets. The upper chamber of our parliament is called the Soviet of the Federation, the Federation Council. What other Soviet power do you need beyond that? Have we not got the State Soviet, the State Council? Did not Comrade Putin chair one? What about the Soviet of Security, the Security Council? The Security Council is a body on the international scale, thus there is a Soviet on the international scale. Thus, if we chase after the word, and we also have to remember that we live in a country of Soviets. Advice. Everybody gives advice to each other. Nothing is getting done, but advice is given freely. This is why we have to remember a saying by a Russian author Kazima Prutkov. If it says buffalo on a cage with an elephant, don't believe your eyes. The whole question is what Soviets are by their notion, not by their name. Because one can make up a name. With regard to this, I would like to give this stern feedback about the previous presentation. It was very correct and I support each statement in it, but it was not the truth. Why? Because it is correct that Marx and Engels insisted that in the transition period there must be the dictatorship of the proletariat. When does the transition period end? And when was communism established in the USSR? In 1935, the transition period towards socialism, i.e. communism, in its lowest stage ended. When some say a phase, it is not clear which regime we are talking about. Socialism is not a phase of communism, but communism itself in its lowest phase. There was a transition period to communism and it ended. Some might have said, drain the water, we don't need the dictatorship of the proletariat anymore. People who criticize other people for rejecting the statement of Marx, people that have not studied Lenin's stage of Marxism, that haven't read Lenin's work Great Beginning, and have not learned that the dictatorship of the proletariat does not end with elimination for the most part of classes, but it remains until the complete establishment of communism, until complete elimination of the classes. This is very important. One could have said, here Khrushchev has arrived and said, the transition period ended a long time ago in the USSR, so we cancel the dictatorship of the proletariat. It would have been possible to present these people almost as Marxists, because Engels said that state is beginning to die out. However, Engels did not say that the state is completely dying out. Moreover, neither Marx nor Engels said that the dictatorship of the proletariat was only for the transition period. Finally, Lenin said that the dictatorship of the proletariat was needed until the complete elimination of the class division. Some of our comrades from the so-called left movement have not learned this yet. In fact, you can only include those who move along the lines of Lenin's formula. This means that not only do we need the dictatorship of the proletariat for the transition period, but for the whole first phase of communism. The thesis about the dictatorship of the proletariat applies to communism in its first phase. It should not be understood in parts, such as economic field and others. Instead, let's take a dialectical understanding of the dictatorship of the proletariat from Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder. The dictatorship of the proletariat means a persistent struggle, bloody and bloodless, violent and peaceful, military and economic, educational and administrative, against the forces and traditions of the old society. The forces and traditions of the old society exist over the whole duration of the first phase of communism. One has to fight against them wholeheartedly. We did not carry out this struggle, and naturally, we were all thrown backwards. And here we are, on the liberated territory of the Soviet Union. Here there is also the Soviet power, for we are now in the building of Leningrad Workers' Soviet, which is renting it. And here we can now freely restart moving forward. I believe that on this subject many lessons have not been learned. 
And above all, what has not been learned by the majority of those who call themselves communists is the definition of Soviets and of the Soviet state. This is why I would like to read out the two most telling theses as I have not learned them by heart yet. In the program of the All-Union Communist Party Bolsheviks, it was the program no one could deviate from it either in 1936 or in 1939. It was the program until 1961. It stated in no uncertain terms, Soviet state is bringing state power closer to the masses among other measures by the fact that it is a production unit, factory, plant, rather than a territorial one that is becoming the electoral constituency and the basic cell of the state. It is written clearly enough. This is why, when some say, people got happy, having built socialism, hurrah, long live, and all that, now one can... What about the program, then? Was the program intended exclusively for the transition period? This program is intended for the period until the complete construction of communism. Alternatively, let's take this in no way insignificant document by Lenin, namely, thesis and report on bourgeois democracy and the dictatorship of the proletariat at the first Congress of the Communist International, March the 4th, 1919. In the summary of this report, it says, the old, i.e. bourgeois democracy and the parliamentary system was so organized that it was the mass of working people who were kept farthest away from a machinery of government. Soviet power, i.e. is so organized as to bring the working people close to the machinery of government. That, too, is the purpose of combining the legislative and executive authority under the Soviet organization of the state and of replacing territorial constituencies by production units, the factory. Not a production constituency, as some say sometimes. Constituencies come from the field of the territorial principle of division. It is production units, so that factory collectives, production communes acted as the very root. We should look from this very perspective at what has to be done for re-establishing the Soviet power in Russia. The first task is, who has to do this? Who can do this? The working class can re-establish it. Workers from the largest factories. This is why preservation of the large factories is one of the tasks. One has to fight for this, to force capitalists to act like capitalists. Otherwise, instead of capital as self-increasing value, they have capital as self-diminishing value. Big industries are not being destroyed in the USA or the UK. Russian capitalists wanted to have everything like in the West. However, instead, everything is like in the marketplace. They simply trade away everything that has been left since the Soviet times. This is the first thing that requires fighting for. Preservation of our factories, plants, and enterprises. Secondly, if a factory plant committee were created at some factory now, nobody would listen to it. Perhaps this is why, when people stopped striking or forgot what a strike was, although there were things worth going on strike about, and no one banned strikes in the Soviet Union, somehow all this was reduced to the processes of unification and simplification. At the same time, any striking struggle gives birth to a strike committee, which immediately goes beyond what an ordinary trade union does. Immediately. Firstly, the strike committee itself never limits itself to the members of the trade union committee. People turn up there who temporarily are active in this organization. They will go again once the strike is over. They will come back again when the situation becomes acute. This strand of people who actively engage in the struggle grows very fast. And what is a strike committee? It is such a committee being based in a factory or a plant which can stop production altogether. It can make people do what is needed. It can set up a voluntary militia in order to protect themselves. They can make people do what the collective demands. This is why the first stage and phase, of course, has to be a strike struggle at the factory. This is why there can be no Soviets unless the working class performs this first step at each factory. The working class also has to learn how to write collective agreements. They have to learn how to fight with their management. Those people who say they cannot do anything, they cannot achieve anything on their own plant, but they will create the Soviet power, and backed by this Soviet power they will fight at once with all the bourgeoisie of the whole world, they sound ridiculous. Kindergarten talk. And most of the people who declare themselves left, communist, etc., sit in this kindergarten. They sit there for now. It doesn't mean that everything is so bad. 
We are now also sat in a kindergarten. This building used to be a kindergarten. After the proletarian revolution, this house was passed on to the inhabitants of the town. So we find ourselves in this kindergarten, but let's leave this kindergarten. Let's move on to the sophomore group, at least. Let's realize that this is not economism. It is not a coincidence that earlier here Ivan Mikhailovich cited from Lenin that economism is worship of spontaneity of the working movement. However, we here set a very definite goal for ourselves and we act consciously. And this is not spontaneous. A party must take part in the workers' movement, if it is indeed a communist party. The party members must not think in this way. We are going to watch what the workers are doing from afar and see if the workers succeed, we will become their leaders. If they don't, we'll distance ourselves because the workers will run into trouble. But we did not take part. So this is the first stage. And this first stage should exist all the time. The factory plant committee should be present and it should not limit itself exclusively to the functions of a trade union. Alexander Sergeyevich, here earlier, has fully proved this thesis and all the stages should be reproduced continually, both historically and logically. The second stage. One needs to establish the Soviets in the cities. One cannot create those in one minute. But one can still mention this here. One needs to set up the Soviets in the cities. Soviets should be created as elected bodies comprised of representatives of the strike committees or factory plant committees. They are the same thing. And it is these bodies which are capable of stopping any production and making people do what needs to be done. They need to defend themselves. Take the current labor code. Open the article about strikes, about collective labor disputes. It says there that who is responsible during a strike for keeping the property intact? It is the strike committee. Who is responsible for maintaining order at the plant during the strike? The strike committee. So one has to set up voluntary militia, since the law directs us thus. One cannot avoid it. The dockers started establishing the voluntary militia immediately. They called security director, the police, and announced that they would be setting up a militia. I had a teacher, Mikhail Alexandrovich Tsegolov. He used to say, I have started landing already. The third stage. I will not answer your question right now, as I have a certain task. I cannot be distracted, as I have to drive the thought to the logical end. The third stage is establishing a central body. This is a very difficult stage, difficult to reach. In 1905, the movement did not reach it. There were Soviets present in numerous cities. They have become there, for all practical purposes, the only power. However, the Paris Commune also was the only power in one city. And these communes, the Soviets, even stood on a higher level, as they were elected from production units. Nevertheless, a central body was not developed. And if we simply call a congress of all these city and regional Soviets, what will come out of this? This congress will get dispersed. This means that one has to convene this congress. It is vital to convene it in a city where there is already a system of two authorities acting simultaneously, somewhere where the Soviets are well established. This was the situation in Petrograd in 1917. It worked in Petrograd and went completely bloodless. Everything happened quietly and peacefully. Some talk about a peaceful revolution. Ours was peaceful. It is very important to understand the necessity of this step. And when people start orating from the parliamentary point of view, give us equal and direct suffrage. This initiative from below does not give you equal and direct suffrage. This gathering of Soviets starting from a production unit. Because people at a factory can only vote for representatives to the city council. The city council can only vote to send representatives to the Congress of Soviets. If you make it direct, as it was done in 1936, when one and a half million elect one deputy to the Supreme Soviet, this can only be done by the regional committee of the Communist Party. People from a factory cannot manage this. The electors need to be able to recall the deputy on each level. And when this recall system actually works, and this is the Soviet principle of the tiered election of the Supreme Body, which is not called the Supreme Soviet, but the Congress of Soviets, which in its turn appoints the Central Executive Committee and the government. The Congress appoints the Central Executive Committee, so it can carry out day-to-day -day governing functions. And this body can be 
cleansed continually and very simply, because the electors recall those deputies who have failed them, those who have distanced themselves from the workers, from the working collectives. And it is this democratic right of recall that Lenin considered the main democratic right. It is not important whom you have elected. If the deputies turn out to be the wrong people, recall them. The Soviet principle allows for constant improvement of the state apparatus and for bringing it closer to the working people. This principle of tiered elections is not as pretty as the parliamentary principle which says we have direct suffrage. It is the bourgeoisie that controls this whole process up to the sky. Thank you for your attention. 